I'd like to spend the next uh, 40 minutes trying to uh, tell you a li little bit about some of the ideas that have evolved in our practice over the last uh, 11 years. Um, maybe looking a little bit at what could be the role uh, played by architects or architecture uh, in society. And, uh, and I think, first of all, architects shouldn't just be designers of beautiful facades or even expressive sculptures. Uh, we should become designers of ecosystems uh, where we channel not only the flow of, uh, of people through our cities and buildings, but also the flow of resources in, into this sort of double system of economy and, and ecology. Um, and the reason for this sort of expanded role of, uh, of architecture uh, is, is found in, uh, in the atmosphere you can trace in this image. Uh, it's a photo taken at the United Nations Conference on Climate Change in Copenhagen two years ago. And as you can see on the faces of, uh, of Brown and Sarkozy and Merkel and even Obama, it wasn't exactly a party. Um, <laughs> it was a complete failure. Uh, none of the goals that had been established for the summit were reached, and the general sort of discussion about sustainability was drowning this sort of common misconception that sustainability is a question of how much of our existing life quality are we prepared to sacrifice in order to afford being sustainable. So, so generally, this sort of Protestant idea that it has to hurt to do good. Um, so when we were asked to look at the Danish pavilion for the Shanghai World Expo that was dealing with sustainable cities, we were thinking, what about a different kind of sustainability? Uh, what if sustainable cities and buildings could actually increase life quality and enjoyment? So like shortly, we tried to condense all of the elements of, uh, of sustainable city life into a pavilion that became like a, a, a looped uh, streetscape complete with the blue bicycle lanes of, uh, of Copenhagen and the Copenhagen city bikes that we've had for the last 20 years, a system of free bicycles. That means that you could basically bicycle through the, uh, the pavilion and experience how fun it is to ride your bike through the city. 37% of the Copenhageners commute by bicycle. Um, two years ago, there was an 11-day traffic jam in China. So some poor bastard was stuck in his car for 11 days. Um, that's, that's the opposite of human enjoyment. Um, so you could also bicycle through the uh, exhibition, <clears throat> also making it the perfect uh, exhibition for impatient people, because you could bicycle through the entire museum and out again in just two minutes without missing anything. Um, also in um, Copenhagen and Shanghai are both port cities, but in Copenhagen our harbor water has become so clean that you can swim in it. So in the middle of the industrial port you can actually sort of uh, jump right into the water, you don't have to drive for hours to get to the beach. Uh, it's almost like Cape Town in that sense. Um, but um, to give the, uh, the visitors this experience, we created a harbor bath uh, in the middle of the pavilion, allowing them to experience how clean, uh, if not how cold, uh, Danish harbor water is. Um, and finally, to uh, attract their attention, um, we found a common denominator between Denmark and China is that in the Chinese public school curriculum, they have uh, three fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen, including The Little Mermaid, uh, the national symbol of Denmark. So we thought, uh, as a way of getting them to come, we would simply move the Little Mermaid, not a copy, but the actual mermaid, would go to China for six months. Um, when the, the Danish Nationalist Party, which is the, essentially the Danish equivalent of the Tea Party, heard about this, uh, they tried to pass a law specifically against moving the mermaid. Um, and I actually had to go to Parliament and argue her case. Uh, and as you can see, we got her. Um, we also had to get her through Chinese customs um, and, uh, and into the pavilion. Um, in, in her absence, uh, we invited the, the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei uh, to make a, a piece. Um, and uh, what he did, that he installed a Chinese surveillance camera in the pavilion. The same camera that the Chinese state has installed in front of his studio. Uh, but this one was actually part of an installation called the Mermaid Exchange that was uh, transmitting a live image to Copenhagen where so like the, the tourists that would go in vain would see that she, at least she was okay. Um, but more importantly, uh, it became like for six months it became like a loophole in the Great Firewall of China, becoming the only place where you had like a live uncensored transmission from China to the rest of the world. So essentially, the Danish pavilion became our first sort of um, venture into this sort of idea of, of hedonistic sustainability, that sustainable cities and architecture can 
uh, increase our, uh, our life quality. Um, another sort of element we've been looking at is architectural alchemy. Uh, the idea that by mixing different ingredients, you can actually create, if not gold, then at least added value. Um, the first example, we did a project called The Mountain in, uh, in Copenhagen, where we essentially create, um, it's almost like a little piece of Cape Town in otherwise completely flat Copenhagen, a mountain of houses with gardens, uh, where you have like the splendors of a suburban lifestyle, your, your kids can run out and play. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, in the middle of a city block. Uh, and this is made possible by putting it on top of a big parking structure. So the parking serves the whole area. There's a single funicular elevator that gives access to all of the apartments. Um, and to make the parking naturally ventilated and naturally illuminated, we clad it in a perforated aluminum uh, that allows it to breathe. Uh, the holes in the aluminum have uh, five different sizes. So, and because the holes look dark on the bright uh, background of the aluminum, from a distance, it turns into a gigantic rasterized image uh, for free. So we commissioned this uh, Japanese Himalaya photographer to turn the entire parking facade into this gigantic urban artwork. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, we took this idea one step further with the same client uh, in a new project on the outskirts of Copenhagen. This, is, this lake is really the city limits, um, and it's going to be part of this new uh, neighborhood. Um, and essentially, um, we mixed shops and offices that like to be close to the customers on the ground with uh, townhouses and apartments. And because commercial space is deeper than residential space, we suddenly get like, almost like a mountain path uh, that moves up. Um, it's, it's really on the, on the city limits, you have this sort of clash of, of life forms. But what happens, um, because of the difference in width, the townhouses, they sit on top of the commercial spaces, and what happens is that we're not only allowed to optimize the conditions for the individual programs, like for instance, in this case, we lift the townhouses up in the sun on the view on top of the offices facing north, but we also allow for the possibility of spontaneous social encounters uh, the creation of a community, uh, the, the creation of a feeling of a neighborhood that is traditionally restricted to occurring on the ground is actually invited to invade the three-dimensional space of the urban block. So the eight house in Copenhagen, as we call the project, is not just you know, a beautiful facade design or an interesting uh, sculpture. It's really a three-dimensional urban condition that carves out various niches for, um, for public life throughout the... Uh, the, the space of the, of the city block. So it really becomes this sort of man-made extension of the, of the landscape of, uh, of Copenhagen. Where the eight house crosses itself, um, we took out all the floors and all of the amenities are tied together in this uh, vertical social space that ties the entire, uh, the, you know, the ground floor uh, all the way up to a, a roof terrace. And the, sort of the, the general idea is that, you see, this is how flat Copenhagen is that this is really the only place in Copenhagen where you can actually go for a walk and enjoy the view of, uh, uh, of, your, of your city. It's almost like a man-made uh, table mountain in, in miniature. Um, and, the, and the general idea is, uh, is synergy, that you can see the, the facades of the offices become the handrails uh, of the street. The, the, the handrail itself becomes the street lights. So like each program somehow collaborates and, and improves the condition for, uh, for the others. So like this is almost an example where a building becomes part of the streetscape uh, of a city. Um, we recently uh, opened an office in, uh, in New York and are starting to do projects in, uh, in North America. Um, one of the first examples is in Vancouver, uh, downtown, where Granville Bridge hits uh, the city. Um, the, the city imagined two new towers, one of them uh, uh, on, on the site belonging to our client. And Vancouver is the second most valuable real estate market in the world because of a massive Chinese immigration. So if you take a typical apartment, 85 square meters, and you move it one floor up, it increases in value with $15,000. Also, there was a park right next to the site where we're not allowed to cast shadows uh, after 10 o'clock in the morning. So you can see the site is totally tortured by uh, this, uh, this highway bridge. So we started map mapping the constraints there's a setback requirement from the street, there's another setback from the highway. Then there's like almost a deal breaker, which is a 30 meter setback from all of the highways, because the city doesn't want anybody living and looking straight out at, the, at cars. Uh, and finally, because of the park, our footprint is reduced to a tiny 600 square meter triangle. 
which is almost too small to, uh, to build. But we thought, like, since our client owns the whole site, and since the 30 meter distance has to do with creating a minimum distance to the cars, as soon as we come up in the air, we can come back out uh, and basically maximize the amount of the nicest apartments. Um, so essentially almost like this wedge. Uh, <laughs> so basically, uh, as you drive over the bridge, it's like somebody pulling a curtain aside, sort of welcome to Vancouver. Um, and what also happens is that you, as you move around the building, uh, the light and shadow is going to give you this sort of gracious uh, curve on an otherwise uh, quite simple uh, uh, tower. Uh, and if you see it on the skyline, it's really like one of the boys, but with this sort of feminine uh, uh, attribute. Um, it's almost like when uh, Flatiron uh, got built, it was like a moment in Manhattan history where real estate value, steel construction and elevators suddenly made a site that had previously been undevelopable into uh, a sort of the, one of the nicest landmarks that's now the namesake for a whole neighborhood in Manhattan. Um, and it's a little bit like this, except ours, we, we call it not the flat iron, but the fat iron, because it sort of bulges out uh, over the waistline. Um, so you can say, like, in a lot of our projects, even though they're privately commissioned, they have an, in, in a, a very sort of intense relationship uh, with the public realm. Um, in some projects, we actually worked much more directly with public clients. Uh, we did a project on the waterfront of Copenhagen that nests uh, a, a sort of a youth club and workshops uh, under this uh, a carpet of a, an undulating wooden dune landscape, uh, almost like turning what would have otherwise been sort of an accumulation of, of sheds into this undulating uh, public space on the waterfront of, uh, uh, of Copenhagen. Um, we got invited to look at a competition for the city hall of Tallinn, the capital of Estonia. Estonia is this, like Tallinn is this beautiful UNESCO World Heritage medieval village. And the job was to sort of uh, consolidate uh, all of the different uh, public departments into a new uh, city hall. And we thought instead of having, you know, this classic dichotomy of the politicians inside and the public outside, we would hover the city hall above a continuous public domain, extending the town square into what we call the public service marketplace that is open for the citizens to walk in and interact with the public servants and see the politicians at work. Um, we, did, we designed one building for each department, but we allowed them to overlap uh, to create, you know, a, a continuous public institution. Um, in one place, the citizens of Thailand could access the roof and enjoy the skyline of the, uh, uh, of the, of the medieval village. And finally, you can see, this is the his, uh, historical uh, city hall. It has a spire. And uh, in, this, in the master plan, they were anticipating a spire because they can't imagine a city hall without a spire. So we thought, let's put the city council uh, in the tower. Uh, let's give them an incredibly generous space uh, for the political debate. Um, the ceiling is made as a gigantic mirror. So with, when politicians have to make difficult decisions, all they have to sort of do is look up and they get this sort of perfect periscope overview of the city that they're messing with. Um, <laughs> as, a, as a side effect, when the angry citizens gather to demonstrate, um, they get this sort of perfect bird's eye view. <clears throat> they can see if... Uh, <laughs> They can see if, um, if some politicians are sleeping or absent or doing dirty deals or playing angry birds on their iPhones. Um, so we call it the, the democratic periscope, <coughs> that it, uh, it combines uh, political overview with public insight. Um, happily, the city council liked the idea, so we're breaking ground uh, uh, in April. Um, and of course, like when you're doing a, a city hall, it's very much about you know, of, of course, like a lot of practical issues and the invitation of the public, but it's also very much about the identity, in this case, of a sort of a post-Soviet democracy that really wants to be about political transparency. <coughs> um, another, another case we did that really deals with, um, uh, with identity uh, is for the National Art Gallery of Greenland. As you might know, Greenland is part of the Royal Danish Kingdom, but they recently acquired independence. And the first uh, project they're doing is, the, um, is going to be the National Art Gallery, which is like right on the waterfront of, uh, of Nuuk. <laughs> you can see it's right next to these uh, like boxy buildings. They are social housing built by the Danish 
in the 70s where they moved the fishermen into these nice uh, apartments that completely disrespect the landscape. Um, um, so we thought like we made the, the art gallery into this uh, 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 circle. All uh, Arctic vernacular typologies are circular because of the minimum circumference and the maximum contained volume. It captures a small courtyard for sculptures, but because it doesn't ignore the topography, it really follows the dramatic landscape. It becomes this melted circle that opens uh, towards the, uh, the water, almost like this sort of oasis in a ver very harsh climate. And following this sort of undulating geometry, um, the, the circle just lifts up and invites people to enter into the museum. Um, and sort of one of the main political points is that as soon as you enter into this sort of eye of the storm, you have this, uh, the melted uh, courtyard frames a view of the Greenlandic landscape, a, a view of the Greenlandic nature and the sculptures outside and the Greenlandic artworks, but all of the Danish architecture has been edited out. So it's like this sort of a uh, little sort of a Greenlandic sanctuary in a sort of city contaminated by, by Danish modern architecture. <coughs> That's a, in, uh, in one case, we took public participation to the extreme. Uh, and, and basically sort of almost resigned authorship to, um, to public participation. Uh, this is a photo taken right next to our office in Copenhagen uh, uh, some years ago. You might remember that Denmark had a cartoon crisis. Um, a, a provincial Danish newspaper commissioned 10 cartoonists to show that in the name of liberty of speech, we can make fun of everything, including the Prophet Muhammad. It pissed off like a billion Muslims uh, here in Syria. And here, uh, this is our office, a group of young, uh, 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 young men from Copenhagen with Islamic background that were really pissed off by this. So it was clear that Copenhagen is no longer like this little cute Danish uh, sort of a, a homogenous culture. It's really part of the global world. No place more than right next to our office, this um, urban space, uh, a mile long, a kilometer and a half, um, which is in the most ethnically diverse neighborhood in all of uh, Denmark. It has 60 different nationalities inhabiting this small uh, uh, area around the, the place. And I'm not going to explain the whole project, just this one aspect. It basically contains uh, what we call the, the red square. This is a photo from the construction site, so um, it's not a Photoshop collage. But essentially you have different shades of, uh, of red that allow for different activities. Um, Next to the red square is the black market, where everything is black, and the green park, where even the sidewalks are, are green. And, uh, and in all this, instead of plastering it with sort of Danish design, we reached out to the local community and asked people to participate in what you could call a global best urban practice. You can almost consider all of planet Earth as a gigantic urban laboratory where we are constantly everywhere conducting experiments in how to best inhabit our cities. Um, and basically, we asked people to nominate elements from their other home country uh, to contribute to this, uh, this urban space. And, and the main idea is that we don't eat Indian food or Chinese food to be nice to the Chinese. It, it has nothing to do with political correctness. It's because sometimes you really crave Chinese food. Uh, and it's the same way with the Moroccan fountain. It's not to be nice to the Moroccans, but it's because Morocco has an amazing sort of tradition for architectural water features. So now we're sort of recreating um, uh, this Moroccan fountain in, uh, uh, in Copenhagen. We have a mussel beach that combines elements from, um, uh, from Venice in Los Angeles uh, with uh, Bangkok, uh, China, and this outrageous Estonian swing. Um, we're actually encountering a liability issue with this, uh, with this swing. Um, we have a, a slide from Ukraine. It's actually from Chernobyl, so we had to make a copy because the original is radioactive. Um, <laughs> Uh, the square, uh, the sign on the red square is the sign from the red square. Um, and even if you take something, you know, simple as bollards, in this case from Ghana, uh, they become like these incredibly exotic objects in grey uh, Scandinavia. Um, like uh, bicycle racks, you need a lot of bicycle racks in, uh, in Copenhagen. This one from Canada that can also pump your bike. Um, and when you look at the benches, it's almost like a sociological study of different cultures from Mexico and Spain, this S-curved bench that allows you to look the person you're sitting next to into the eyes. Uh, uh, from Belgium, uh, the opposite, everybody's looking away from each other. Uh, you have, uh, <clears throat> so essentially like, it's almost like an architectural safari looking at these different urban uh, practices. This nice octopus from, um, from Japan. Um, uh, 
uh, a snow cannon from Sweden. I'm sad to say that we have no uh, South African objects. Uh, you should move to Copenhagen, then we'll uh, we'll make one. Um, bird cages from uh, um, from uh, Rotterdam. Uh, we even found uh, palm trees in China that naturally grow in snow. Uh, so now we have these uh, palm trees that really naturally grow in, in our climate. Finally, one of the main reminders that you're in a foreign culture when you're traveling is actually, paradoxically, the advertisement. So as a series of sculptural lamps, we installed these neon signs that advertise stuff you can't buy in Denmark. Um, uh, so uh, so my, my favorite is, uh, this is a dentist in Qatar. Um, and of course you have um, on the red square like this sort of ensemble of uh, former communist uh, advertisement. The Moscovite was supposed to be the worst car ever produced. Um, so you can say like in a way by tapping into this sort of cultural diversity of the local neighborhood and assigning authorship to the citizens we you know of course accelerate a sense of ownership and integration but also we end up creating an, a public urban space that really uh, yeah, that doesn't sort of per perpetuate this sort of petrified perception of, of Denmark as being a homogenous culture, but really reveals the true cultural uh, uh, diversity of contemporary Copenhagen. That brings me to the, to the last uh, um, idea that, that has sort of started to, um, to interest us in, uh, uh, in the office. Um, social infrastructure. <clears throat> and um, basically one of the ideas is that there's almost like this sort of uh, rule uh, in, in life that the, the infrastructure of uh, the industry of the past gets reinvented as the infrastructure for, or the framework for social life and culture uh, of the present. Like one example is that uh, this is Park City, Utah. It used to be a mining town. And in fact, the first ski lift in the world was the repurposed uh, mining lift that used to drag silver down from the mountain. And when the mines dried out, they had to do something, so they started dragging skiers up the mountain. So essentially the plumes of smoke have been replaced by snow cannons today. Um, also, um, Park City has become the home of the Sundance Festival. Um, and uh, in Park City there's an art center called Kimball, which is actually a repurposed garage uh, infrastructure for cars turned into art museum. And, and right next to it, you can see uh, this building. It's the Coalition Mining Building. It's basically where this, uh, the mining lifts used to enter into town and get loaded onto the trains. Um, sadly, it burned down in the 80s. It was really the sort of landmark of Park City, the, the mining town. Um, and now it's uh, home for the Sundance Festival and it has like a, uh, uh, this art center. And we were asked to sort of make a new art museum. Um, so basically, we, we leave the existing garage where it is for a learning center and then we add the, the galleries uh, and the, the lobby and the restaurant uh, in this new uh, consolidated building. Uh, the, the lower gallery for artificial light and media is sort of uh, nested into the hill. Uh, and on top, uh, the upper gallery with daylight and, and views is sort of turned to look up Heber Avenue, which is the main arrival from, uh, from the mountain to town sort of almost like a friendly building that turns its head and sort of welcome to, uh, to Park City, sandwiching the public spaces between the two galleries. Um, and then sort of how do you integrate a new building and a new architecture into this sort of historical like raw charm of a former mining town and sort of a logging town? The, the majority of the immigrants were actually Scandinavians and they brought with them the log cabin construction of overlapping logs that they also used for the mining shafts and for their homes. Uh, and it has been sort of uh, rarefied in various ways in Utah. In this, this is a corn silo that has these very elegant uh, tectonic joints. Uh, and even the, the Navajos, their Hogan's, uh, the traditional houses, are made with these uh, logs, massive logs that create complex uh, curvilinear shapes. Um, and finally, the Pacific Railroad that used to cross the, the Great Salt Lake uh, is now decommissioned and there's a company that extracts the piles that have been marinated, marinated in, in salt for, for decades and it's now this sort of um, recycled timber. <clears throat> so we thought like really to tap into this um, sort of industrial her heritage and really try to do uh, an actual log cabin. Uh, we, we built the, the model, uh, we almost make models out of foam, in this case we really built the, the building the way you would build the, the museum with these overlapping logs and the thickness of the massive wood allows us to create uh, this sort of uh, gently curving shape with a completely 
uh, uh, traditional uh, construction technique. So it almost becomes like this massive abstract sculpture of, uh, of massive wood uh, in the city. And it has exactly the same silhouette as the old coalition building, so almost like re reinvoking the ghost of the past, uh, sort of reborn for, uh, as a space for, for art. Also, the, the, the coalition building used to be this sort of steel skeleton inside a wooden frame, uh, and the structure for the galleries, because you need to climate control the, the art pieces, it's a steel structure that's like nested into this wooden frame, and where all of the circulation is like really integrated in the, in the wood frame. So here you see sort of the building sort of turning its head, looking up and down Main Street. As you enter, you really follow the massive wood uh, on the stairs, uh, moving up through the galleries, the, uh, the restaurant that opens to the, to the roof terrace of the existing building. And finally, sort of following the light and walking along the wood, you, um, you move off past the administration into the, the upper gallery, where you have this beautiful view of, uh, uh, of the city. And it becomes the first thing you see when you enter to town. You can see the exhibition that's, that's on in, uh, uh, in the Kimball. So in a way, we, if you look at it, it almost becomes like the sort of the recreation of the ghost of the coalition building that used to be the landmark of Park City, the mining town, and now reborn as this sort of gathering point for the new cultural life and art of, uh, of Park City. So, um, so in many ways, like Park City is sort of this typical example that this, the infrastructure for the past gets reinvented as infrastructure for, for cultural and social programs. Uh, we did a project in, uh, in Copenhagen. This is the, the castle of Shakespeare's Prince Hamlet. Uh, it also became UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, and as a result, the Danish Maritime Museum, which was inside the castle, had to be kicked out. Uh, and they had to put it inside, or they proposed to put it inside this old dry dock where they used to uh, make uh, ships. Uh, but the museum program was twice the size of the dock itself. So we would almost drown the, uh, the dock in museum. Uh, and we thought it would be much more interesting to keep the dock as this big monumental, 125 meter long, 25 meter wide industrial space. Um, also, right now the dock, as you can see, is full of water. So when you empty it, the, the walls are in such a bad state that we would have to reinforce the dock from the inside to take the pressure, or from the outside. Um, so we thought, if we're going to make new dock walls anyway, why not leave enough space so we can nest the museum between the old and the new dock walls? So essentially turning the museum brief inside out, um, so the, the museum really becomes like a giant hole in the ground, like a, a big public space sunken into the, into the city. And there was this dilemma in the, in the project that UNESCO said that the, the museum had to be completely invisible to not disturb the view of the castle. But the, the, the client and the sponsors wanted some kind of architectural masterpiece to sort of attract uh, visitors. And by turning it into a void, we could actually combine the need for invisibility with the desire for exposure. Um, we created a series of bridges, one that takes you into the museum and contains uh, galleries inside, uh, one for the auditorium and one for the cafe. And essentially these bridges bring daylight into the museum, even though everything is underground and actually underwater. It becomes this like, very sort of generously illuminated uh, space. So we did this project and we thought like, it's going to be hard to win it because there was like, one condition in the brief, and that was that we were not supposed to um, uh, build outside the dock. Um, and we built essentially the entire museum around the dock. Uh, but the jury liked it, uh, and we, we won the, the competition. But then something strange happened. The, the Danish Architects Association, uh, which is my union, uh, they sued the client for having chosen a project that uh, broke the conditions of the brief. Uh, they didn't say it was a bad idea, they just said that you know, they couldn't do it. Um, that seriously made me reconsider my membership of the Danish uh, Architects Association. <laughs> Um, but happily, our client had gotten so convinced about this idea that they decided, they said, okay, we cancel the competition and we hire big as, a, as our architects. Uh, so now we, we start a construction and it's this... Uh, uh, so now we start a construction and it's, this, it's actually the tallest building uh, we've built in, in, uh, in Denmark, but it's 40 meters from zero and down, uh, which is kind of surreal. Um, that brings me to the last, um, last project that deals with, uh, uh, with this condition. Uh, we got commissioned by, of the sort of the interlace of, of public life and infrastructure, we got commissioned by the 10 municipalities of Copenhagen to look 
at a new master plan uh, uh, for, the, for the 10 municipalities along a new proposed train line. And we thought, like, if you're looking at, the, at Greater Copenhagen, it, we can't just look at Copenhagen or even just look at Denmark, because like, right on the other side of the water is Sweden. Um, and together they form the most prosperous and the most densely populated region in, uh, in Scandinavia. And simply by adding uh, a four kilometer bridge, we can turn it into an entire binational metropolitan loop where no area is further away than 40 minutes uh, by train. Uh, and it wouldn't just be like an infrastructure for, uh, you know, for trains or, or highways, it's also an infrastructure for waste management, for water management, for sewage systems, for like a smart grid that combines the hydroelectricity of Sweden with the wind power of Denmark and also combines all of the most prosperous industries in, uh, uh, in the region. Um, and sort of by creating a binational metropolitan region, we also introduce pink in a Scandinavian flag uh, for the first time. Um, and it actually has the same size as the San Francisco Bay Area, so urbanistically it's a qu kind of well-known uh, quantity. The only difference is that it happens on two sides of, uh, uh, of two different countries. So the, the basic idea is that the, the, the infrastructure is really nested together with uh, the sort of the local urban densification. So like the, uh, the infrastructure is really part of the, the city space itself. To give you an example of a, of a concrete project within this, this bigger master plan, uh, we recently uh, um, did a competition for a waste to energy power plant in the middle of the Loop City. Uh, it's in the middle of Copenhagen. Um, and it's essentially, uh, in Denmark, we only landfill 4% of our waste, 42% gets recycled, and 54% is turned into. Um, <laughs> um, we didn't have anything to do with this. It was just. Uh, <laughs> the good behaving Danes, uh, but essentially uh, three kilos of household waste turns into uh, four hours of domestic electricity and five hours of heating and seen as an energy source, a ton of trash equals uh, almost two barrels of oil. Um, but of course these waste to energy power plants are big ugly factories, they are necessarily placed in the cities, so how can you sort of make sure that they don't become ugly boxes that cast shadows on the neighbors and block the view? This one is going to be the biggest and tallest building structure in Copenhagen. Um, right next to the Copenhagen Marina and right next to where the local boys go water skiing. And, uh, and speaking of skiing, we actually have a cold climate in Denmark. We have snow, but as, as you saw in Copenhagen, it's completely flat. We have no hills. So we might not have mountains, but now that we have mountains of trash, we thought, you know, Copenhagen has happy go six hours by bus to go to this ski resort in, uh, in south of Sweden. Uh, so we can actually put it uh, the same size on top of, uh, uh, of the power plant. We know exactly how big the different machines have to be. Um, and instead of having some kind of a visitor center where school teachers drag the kids to force them to hear how trash turns into energy, here you can take the elevator up to the roof and you can choose between a green, a blue and a black ski slope. Um, so, as miraculously, we won the competition based on this idea. Uh, so, from 2016, uh, you have to look out for the Danish competitors in the Alpine skiing competitions, because now we can actually, uh, you know, ski at home. Also, the, uh, the, the building is designed in such a way that it naturally filters uh, daylight into the workspaces. It uses natural illumination and, and natural ventilation as much as possible. So, you can say, in many ways, the ecosystem that I started with, this idea of trying to design our cities and buildings as entire ecosystems, is quite close to coming to fruition here, because not only do we locally harvest the available resources, the rainwater, the, the daylight, uh, uh, the natural ventilation, but also together with the city, uh, we form an entire ecosystem, almost like an urban metabolism. Lastly, this is going to be the most uh, um, clean waste to energy plant in the world. Um, Smoke coming out of the chimney is completely non-toxic, but it does still contain a certain amount of CO2. Um, so we worked with Realities United, a Berlin-based uh, artist and architecture group, to design um, the mouth of the chimney in such a way that it accumulates CO2, and when there's 100 kilos, it puffs a gigantic smoke ring. <laughs> And, and of course, we, we like this as the ultimate artistic expression of, of hedonistic sustainability, that what used to be a problem, pollution, turns into something playful that puffs smoke rings. 
Um, but more importantly, one of the main drivers of behavioral change is knowledge that if people don't know, they can't act. And because, you know, CO2 emissions is so abstract, nobody knows what a ton of CO2 is. If you come to Copenhagen in 16, all you have to do is count the smoke rings, and when you've counted 10 of them, we just emitted one ton of, uh, of CO2. Um, actually, in interesting, as a side effect, we, we, sort of, we took the idea of skiing and put it on the power plant. Now we actually just got a job in, uh, in Finland putting a ski slope on top of a, of a ski hotel, sort of uh, bringing the idea back to, uh, to where it came from. Um, You'll say, like, one of the last objections that I, that I get when I present these ideas, especially now that we moved to, uh, to America, is that everybody's saying, yeah, yeah, but, you know, this only works in, like, semi-socialist Scandinavia, where, you know, everybody has money and nobody cares about anything but the environment. Um, but, uh, but actually, uh, we got, uh, the reason we opened up an office in New York a year and a half ago was that we got contacted by uh, the, the Durst family, uh, a Manhattan real estate developer, uh, to look at a site in Hell's Kitchen right on the west side waterfront. A beautiful location on the water, but right next to a power plant and a waste management facility, not, not combined, but separated, and, uh, and, the, and the west side highway. So we thought, like, it's a beautiful location, but it's a very sort of industrial neighborhood. We should almost create an urban oasis for the residents. And in a way, you can say the Copenhagen courtyard the idea of creating like an oasis in the middle of the city is at the architectural scale, what Central Park is at the urban scale, sort of an urban oasis surrounded by density. So um, the idea became like, what happens when you combine a New York skyscraper with a Copenhagen courtyard? Or essentially, what would a court scraper look like? Um, so we placed the, the courtyard next to the Helena, this tower. It's not only owned by our client, it's also named after his daughter. Uh, so we preserve uh, all of the views. Um, and then basically to give it Manhattan density, we lift up the northeast corner to 460 feet, um, maximizing uh, daylight exposure to the south and the west, and also preserving the views uh, of the river, creating this sort of rather unusual new silhouette on, uh, on the west side waterfront, like almost like a, a sort of a completely distorted uh, uh, Copenhagen courtyard building. And the courtyard, which is traditionally like a secret kept for the tenants or for Google Earth, becomes like a major part of the, of the public perception of, a, uh, of the building. A spire seen from the east. Uh, you have terraces sunken into the roofscape. And uh, because of the asymmetry, all of the apartments and the courtyard itself actually has views of, uh, of the Hudson River and, uh, and the west side. So you can say like the sort of the urban rejuvenation of the former industrial piers of, uh, uh, of Manhattan that are now sort of starting to become the, the Hudson River Park starts to sort of invade the city fabric itself, nesting a green space for, uh, for social life in the middle of, a, uh, of the Manhattan city block. So we are we're scheduled to break ground in, um, uh, at the end of March this month, uh, a historical moment for our little office. Uh, and uh, in four years, this is what it would look like driving up and down uh, uh, the West Side Highway. Now I'm down in Tribeca, right next to the narrow, but I'll be hood forever. I'm the new Sinatra, and since I made it here, I can make it anywhere. Yeah, they love me everywhere. I used to cop in Harlem, all of my Dominicanos right there up on Broadway. Pull me back to that McDonald's, took it to my stash spot, 560 State Street. Catch me in the kitchen like a Simmons whipping pastry. Statue of Liberty, long live the world trade, long live the king, yo. I'm from the Empire State. Actually, just to, um, to finish on a, on a happy, loving note, uh, the, the, the West 57 building, the court scraper, is not going to be our first built structure in Manhattan. Because actually, um, for, for the lucky ones of you, uh, you noticed that it was um, Valentine's Day recently. Uh, and um, every year they do a small art piece on, uh, on Times Square. And we did this little piece that's like a forest of acrylic columns that as people interact with it, it, uh, it starts beating uh, stronger and stronger. So we made this little, uh, 
this little film that also expresses uh, our love for our new home in uh, in New York. Push me and then just touch me till I can get my satisfaction. Push me and then just touch me till I can get my satisfaction. Satisfaction. Till I can get my satisfaction. 